Uh, hey, everybody at home, uh, I want to let you know that I am sitting with the most impressive person I have ever met in the Bigfoot community known as Thomas Steedenberg. And he is a bit of a whiz when it comes to data and his capacity to data collect is a, a great example for all of us exactly how to uh, interview people and uh, expand on what you're doing out in an area. But just kind of before we get going, I'm going to share a little quick video with everybody at home there just to, uh, to give them an idea about who you are, Thomas, if that's okay with you. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just give me a second here to set that up. And uh, Leon Thompson Production. Everybody, I'm actually with Thomas Steenberg right now. Thomas is an encyclopedia of Bigfoot Sasquatch history. Figure the creature she was looking at. Oh, it was called. It's also known as Playboy. Because the girl, the main girl, was uh, Lisa Marie Goodard, who was Miss Centerfold 1984. <laughs> okay. And she was hosting. You guys catch that at yeah. all? <laughs> I've never been able to find a copy of that, 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 uh, the, the Playboy, because I always like to have a picture of the witness for the bottom. <laughs> We're uh, a so called young Sasquatch, was supposedly captured by railway workers when they were building the Trans Canada Railway in 1884. And she looked out and she didn't see a cow, she saw this figure coming out of it. Because it seemed to be malingering in the tree line. And then when I said to you, I've seen a, a coyote do that same sound, the first thing you said to me was, did you get a video of it? <laughs> yeah. Sasquatch round number 10203, in other words, 203. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was January 28, 2017. Thank you to DJ Cooper, Bob, Cripple, Merrick. A few short years ago, 2016, Dino River track from Titmus. Okay, that's there's no way. There you go. By the way, you, you, you had it labeled as silver flat? To yeah, I know. Flat. Um, the, uh, Too high yeah, tech you, whiz. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is us practice for the seniors. Like, <laughs> uh, like when it, you saw that interview I did with Alex from Sasquatch Out of the Shadows there, I just brutalized First Nations language totally. And I, I, so you feel, feel free to correct me in any way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my, I, you tell my, me half the time I can't pronounce the words so like every one of them's got 40 letters in it. <laughs> yeah. And where's the influxes? Yeah. <laughs> How do you do the thing? Yeah. Uh, Thomas, can you kind of share with your, with the people at home, um, how you kind of got involved and how long you've been doing this for? Well, I've been fascinated by the Sasquatch mystery ever since I was old enough to read. I mean, we're going back when I was a, a wee lad in the mid 1960s. Um, my parents brought home a um, hardcover reader digest book for education purpose for me and my sister who's two years younger than I am. And that book had chapters on everything you can think of, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes. And of course, as usual, they had the big section on the age of the dinosaurs with the beautiful color paintings, you know, of T-Rex yep. standing straight up, dragging his tail on the ground, something they know that didn't happen back then. And right in the middle of that dinosaur session was a little two-page uh, article uh, um, with three fuzzy black and white photographs called The Thing in Loch Ness. Right. I don't know. It's like a button uh, click because I read that about 80 times. And I pestered my parents. They ended up getting me a library card and, of course, uh, going to the library and getting books on uh, cryptozoology, and I don't even think that term was in use then. Hmm. Uh, I started reading to find out more about the Loch Ness Monster. I started reading about this thing in Western Canada called the Sasquatch, and the Americans call it Bigfoot. By the way, you need to change Bigfoot Okanagan to Sasquatch Okanagan. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, uh, but I think what really did it was not too long after that on a school night when I should have been in bed 
I came w walking downstairs. My parents were in the living room watching a movie on the old black and white TV. And I fully expected to get a blast from my, my father, you know, Hey boy, you should be upstairs. What are you doing? That kind of thing. Yep. But he didn't, he said, you know, the lad's interest in this kind of thing. Maybe we should let him watch it. My mother said, Oh no, no, he can't watch this. He'll have bad dreams or something along that line. But my father won the argument and uh, I guess he's regretted that ever since. <laughs> and uh, what was playing was that old hammer horror film starring Peter Cushing, the abominable snowman of the Himalayas. Yeah. I remember it. Uh, it was Sasquatch from that day on. And that's all I basically thought about and read ab and, and tried to read about. I annoyed the hell out of my teachers in the school with it. Uh, but when I did a presentation on it, I got, I, one teacher gave me 110 out of 100 on it and asked me to present it to other classrooms. And I, I, I joined the Army because it was my ticket out west because I was in Ontario at the time. And, I, and at that time, I naturally thought of the Sasquatch as a West Coast phenomenon. Yeah, I never really heard of anything in Ontario except around Cobalt where they had a rash of incidents over a, a three-decade period of an animal that was locally known as Old Yellow Top. But when I moved out west with the army, I took one look at the Rocky Mountains, having seen them for the first time in my life, and saying to myself, well, you know, there's no boundary or wall built between British Columbia and Alberta. If they've been seen in eastern BC, they have to be seen here too. So I decided to put an ad in the local press, and it was very simple. Sasquatch. Anyone who believes they may have had a sign on this creature, please call Thomas Steenberg and the phone number. And I didn't expect much to result, but oh hell, my phone was ringing almost on a daily basis. Wow. And that's why we first got introduced to um, uh, the late Professor Vladimir Markotic, who was a professor of archaeology and anthropology at the University of Calgary. And he invited me to meet with him, and I think uh, my knowledge of the subject that, that impressed him enough that we sort of came unofficial partners. He did the academic stuff and I did the field research because he, he was a senior citizen then too. He was already in his late seventies. And it was uh, through Vladimir that I eventually uh, met um, uh, the, the late Grover Krantz, you know, and, uh, and uh, made contact with him. I, I met of course and became good friends with the late John Green for many years and Bob Tippis and uh, the late Rene de Hinden. Okay, um, all the original four horsemen I knew, uh, I knew and did a lot of research with, all except Peter Byrne, who I never met face to face until 2010. Right, and uh, we exchanged letters and stuff like that. But I, I have to admit, I kind of uh, avoided it because I it was well known that John Green couldn't stand him. <laughs> so, <laughs> and John was very well known for saying, if you do, if anyone does anything with Peter Burns, they'll never do anything with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept Peter in the closet, so to speak. And of course, Rene was always pestering me about what everyone else was saying, because I always like to say one of my achievements in this was um, being able to be friends and do research with all these guys. And, uh, not get sucked into their personal wars and disagreements because you couldn't get these guys in the same room together, mm. you know, and, uh, not much has changed and not much has changed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, but one for some reason, and, uh, and they didn't do it with hardly anyone else. They knew I was seeing uh, the other uh, guys to doing work with the other guys, but none of them held it against me. Mm. And, uh, like Rennie was always saying, so what does that tip me say about this or that? You know, and I I just simply say, well, Rennie, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not, I didn't tell him what you said. I'm not going to tell you what he said, you know. And uh, he didn't like it, but uh, he, uh, he accepted it. And uh, he never held it against me. And I know he held it against a lot of other people, but uh, mm. not me. I don't know why. I mean... And in those well, you've heard me say this. I I, I love the uh, the late Randy De Hinden, and I like to think he loved me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and back in back in the old days, Thomas, in the old days, what was the view on Sasquatch with those guys? They were all zoological. 
All of them. Uh, if the Sasquatch does indeed exist, it's, it's probably an animal, a primate. Uh, and they were all in that camp. We tend to, well, I use the term now, inmates running the asylum. Uh, back then, they used to call them the uh, lunatic fringe. You know, people go off <laughs> on uh, wild stories about the fourth dimension and spiritualism and all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And uh, we didn't want to be people who just like that because as far as we were concerned, all they are, are they're chasing their tails. They're trying to answer a mystery by invoking another mystery and then bringing in a third mystery. <laughs> yeah. And we felt, we felt always felt man, that if the Sasquatch exists, it's a creature of flesh and blood. It's always been here. And hopefully it w always will be. Um, Cause I, I don't think they're as rare as some people think, but I don't think there's a great many of them either. Um, uh, and let's face it, they're the world champion hide and seekers. So when you, when you did your first investigation, was it with those guys specifically? Oh, no. I before I even met them, I did four or five years just doing stuff on my own. And could you tell yeah. me a little bit about the first call that kind of came in for you? Where oh, geez, I don't even remember. I think the first one I really looked into in Alberta was an Australian tourist who was driving, driving the uh, 1A highway through the, the, through, through the uh, uh, Indian Reservation, um, just be, before you get to Camor on the Trans-Canada Highway, but he was on the 1A, the old highway, mm -hmm. and he called up to say he saw what he thought was a orangutan crossing the road. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that popped in his head, orangutan. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until he started asking questions about it, he heard about this strange creature. In he'd, he'd never heard of the Sasquatch or Bigfoot. He had heard of the Yeti and the Paul, but he had never heard that. He was a tourist. He said, and his words was a great big bloody orangutan. Mm -hmm. And he showed me where it happened. And, uh, and I was fascinated. You could see scalp marks in the bank where something had climbed, but they were not discernible footprints. And he was so convinced that it was orangutan, except it was walking upright. Mm -hmm. That's what it reminded him of. And he didn't see it for very long. He just slammed on the brakes of a rental car he was driving and uh, watched it disappear over the bank. And it was gone. Mm -hmm. And when you, uh, like on that little quick video I showed of you, um, the, one of the things that I've really admired about you has been the way you systematically kind of look at things objectively. And uh, also when you're interviewing people, the way you interview people, you have a, I think you, you talked to me about uh, having, you, you have a, a, a personal questionnaire, I think, that you did up. Is that correct? Yes. And is that, and how many questions roughly do you have? You know, on well, that? I think there are about 45 questions on it. And I've added to it over the years if I think of other things to say and I've rearranged things. But I basically have used the same questionnaire from the beginning. And uh, my philosophy from the beginning has always been stick to the facts, never deviate from the facts, and don't go off into wild speculation, right? When you interview a witness, so you have to look at it as almost like in a police investigation. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, to me, it's, um, uh, you, you don't ask leading questions. You let the witness answer it in the wrong way, in the wrong words. And when I tried to write them down and I had horrible arguments with the publishers first Western and later on Hancock house publishers, because when I uh, published the books and I gave it writ written transcripts of the interview for the books, they wanted me to clean up the grammar, you know, they, you know, I said, well, no, that's not what they said. I mean, I'm not interviewing Christopher Hitchens every time here, you know. You know, this is the way they said it, I think. And, and I won out in the end. And uh, I think it, it was the right call because you get a better idea who you're dealing with when you see what they said word for word. Ooms and ahs all, you know, put in where they are. Where they are. The squaring, everything. <laughs> try to clean up a little bit like you know, on, on, symbols rather than the words but yeah, right. yeah. And I, I noticed on, on your new like you're, you're starting a new kind of uh angle online on youtube um and the links the link you guys will be below here and because what you've been doing is when i came and visited you uh, a few years ago you have all these cassettes of all these people that you had had interviewed 
And of course, cassettes, some of the younger folk are, what's a cassette? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, they're little plastic things like this. <laughs> they always get stuck inside of your vehicle when you're listening to them uh, as they unwound inside of your uh, radio <laughs> or your tape player. Uh, but uh, one of the things I liked about what you're doing now is because you're doing exactly that same strategy is you're just reading exactly the way the wording is with the same inflection that you heard on the tape because you're using the transcripts because the uh, tapes weren't are, are not that good a quality because some of those are got to be what 30 years old tapes yeah 30 35 years old most of them and uh, and of course set tapes deteriorate with time but I have to admit um, when I started there was no internet or anything like that so I never had them with the idea that they would be published someday you know I had no idea uh, so what I've done on YouTube, you notice I've, uh, on some of them, I've, I've read the transcripts, but then I also post the actual interview if people actually want to try and listen to it. So, you know, I'm not making this up. You know, I'm saying exactly what they said, word for word. Uh, they're not all like that. Some of them are, uh, and there's going to be more put on the, my YouTube site as, uh, as time goes by that uh, reading the transcripts is not necessary. They're very, you're very readable, but the early, early ones, you no, know, it was, like, you know, I didn't like to be rude to people. So if they had their TV blasting in the background or something, I wouldn't ask them to turn it off. You know? right. Like I did uh, Ralph and Jennifer Bob, who had their signing in 1973. When I went to interview her, the most annoying thing about that interview is you hear the, the Steve Martin movie, The Jerk, in the background and <laughs> talk almost as loudly as she is because I didn't want to be rude and ask her to turn her television off. <laughs> she did eventually do it on her own. But yeah. <laughs> It's kind of funny, you're, you're listening to that serious talk. And well, how tall do you think? Seven, eight feet, and you hear Steve Martin. Oh, wow, he really hates his cans. But, you know, it's that kind of thing. You didn't want to be rude to people or, or, or assume too much. I, I stopped doing that as time went by. You know, I, did, I like to meet witnesses someplace quiet, either their residence or mine or someplace nice and quiet where there's not a lot of background noise, you know, most times they want to meet in a coffee shop or something somewhere. Well, first annoying thing about that is the overhead music they're playing. They're not going to turn it off for you. So, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And everyone clinking and clanking in the background. And uh, the Mike McDonald interview, which I've been in, I interviewed him right at a table at the, at the Sasquatch Symposium we had at the Planetarium in 97. You're actually hearing Rennie DeHinden and Scott Harriet joking with each other in the background because they, st they were standing 10 feet away listening to all that. Yeah. So, that's how I was interviewing them. So, yeah. <laughs> So people probably get a kick out of that. but yeah. Well, one of the interesting tapes you had talked to me about when I was visiting you was that one with the, I think it was a sheriff who went to, I think it was, this was in the States. Help me if I'm wrong on this one. But I think you were talking about how there was a Sasquatch report that came in and he was radioing in uh, back. It was a, there was a series of reports going in. It happened on the Lummi Reserve in Washington, which is just south of the border here. And it happened in 1975. It was a, a series of incidents. Uh, this has gone on in the Lummi Reserve quite often. They have years where there's no sightings, and all of a sudden for a period they get a dozen or so, uh, almost, as, almost as something. One has come into the area, hung around for a while, and then moved on. And what happened in 1975 is um, uh, his, he was Deputy Sheriff Kenny Cooper, and he changed his name later on. He's, he's passed away now, unfortunately. But uh, Kenny Cooper, uh, he changed his name to his Lummy name. And again, it was something with 40 letters in it. I couldn't begin to pronounce it. So I'll just continue to call him Deputy Sheriff Kenny Cooper, the <laughs> Lummy police uh, uh, force, um, was responding to an, an, a, a prowler call uh, where a lady saw something in her backyard. And as he was going down the road, they didn't actually see the animal emit the noises. But when the animal disappeared as he was driving down the road, he could hear the noises coming from the trees just after, not too long after they lost sight of it. And he had the presence of mind to pull over and contact the, um, the headquarters. And they recorded it over the police mic on what was known back then as a dictaphone. You may remember those. Anyone younger than 50 will not remember what those were. 
it was a dictaphone, which is just a way of recording uh, uh, telephone conversations back in the good old days, <laughs> you know, and it was right over the police mic. So the sound went through the police mic, over the radio waves, into the police station radio, and was recorded on a dictaphone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they're the most famous uh, or the most intriguing alleged Sasquatch screen recordings that I have ever heard. And um, I still wonder about. Yeah. And how clear were those on the tape? Like, are they still fairly yeah, clear? They're not. I can play it for you right now if you like. Well, if you got it handy, like. that'd be awesome. Uh, let's see if I got this right and I got it in the right position. If you can hear it. Uh, my little Sony, I even got a digital recorder now, so I don't use a tape recorder anymore. <laughs> Getting right into modern times, I am. Yeah. Okay, let's see if this will work for you. Volume way up. So that's through two different receiving mics, isn't it? Yeah, the police mic in the car, the radio receiver at the station, and the dictaphone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine what it sounded like to his ears, but he never forgot it. Hmm. Yeah. And again, it's the only one I know of, other than the so-called Sierra sounds, where somebody thought they saw a Sasquatch just before the sounds were recorded. But again, even in this case, they weren't looking at the animal at the moment it made those sounds. Hmm. Yeah. And um, I mean, they're, they're, I like to get you online a few times because you just have way too much stuff that I know, unfortunately, that the viewers <laughs> don't know. So my brain's going about 15 different angles that we could definitely talk about and stuff. Um, you've written like four, four books now, is that correct? I've written three myself and co-authored two others, total of five. And what's the latest one that was you, you got revised that you just put out? Oh, that was the first book, The Sasquatch in Alberta. It was republished in 2018 as The Sasquatch in Alberta. And there was some updates added to the back of it. That because yeah, I wrote that book in uh, 1990. So, and I stayed in Alberta another uh, good number of years. I didn't leave Alberta until 2002. So, but I continued to investigate. And even after that, I still hear about things. So, I, uh, Hancock House thought it'd be a good idea to update the book and republish it. And I did. Yeah. Nice. Be in Alberta. Yeah. Back here as well for you guys yeah. at home. I highly uh, advise you to check it out. And Thomas, because you have been here for so long on the Bigfoot scene and stuff, you started getting into it being asked to do a variety of documentaries and a different TV shows and stuff like that. Would you just mind sharing a bit about some of the interesting uh, shows you've been on and documentaries? Oh, Monster Quest. I uh, was on Monster Quest twice. Uh, uh, on the Road Again, a Canadian documentary series here. I was on that program. Um, Creepy Canada. I was a guest on one of their episodes. Um, a lot of American documentaries that I've, I've never even had the opportunity to see hmm. because I don't have cable TV. I gave up cable TV in the year 2000 because I didn't like their package system. They were charging me too much and I'm not spending $80 a month to watch commercials 50% of the time. They right. could pay me to watch their commercials. <laughs> and I've stuck to that because I'm too big at it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, a lot of my matter of fact, um, um Thursday, and there's a group from Omni Films that wants to start uh, preparation for a documentary. Uh, I'll be going out with them the last Thursday of this month, and uh, so it continues. Mm -hmm. And did uh, Searching for Bigfoot, did they come up to Mission, to your area there, and you kind of helped that show out a little bit with uh, Bo? Yeah, well, in 2016, they were up here um, uh, uh, doing their, the episode of which is Squatch here, British Columbia or Washington, remember? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Cliff and, and Matt Moneymaker came up here where it was Bobo and Renee, the lady Renee stayed in Washington. There's a reason why they did that, but I, I'm, I'm I don't think I should go into that. 
because <laughs> James Faye's kind of a friend of mine. I don't, I don't want to embarrass him enough. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but there's a reason he, uh, he, he stayed in Washington. And um, uh, they came up here, and I don't know. Uh, all, most of the people in that town hall meeting were people that I, I from my files, I asked to help them. But, again, they do things on that show because people forget it's a show, right? And uh, they do things on that show they'd never do in real life in their own research, but they do it because the the audience demands it. I mean, if they did a documentary the way I think it should be done, it probably wouldn't last more than one season because the general population would find it awful boring, Mm -hmm. right? So they do things like uh, that signing of that uh, We Were Late there that they did, uh, the two people from my files I asked to join. It shows Matt and Cliff on a speedboat in Harrison Lake and then they pull up to the dock on Weaver Lake. Well, they couldn't have done that unless they portaged that boat over two kilometers of mountains and rocks. <laughs> uh, why do you do that? And then they made the statement, they were the first researchers, investigative team ever to do research on the Shea's Reserve. And I thought, well, what have I been doing here for 40 years? And what was John Green doing for 20 years before me and Renee? <laughs> you know, we were all there a hundred times. They had the nerve to say on that program that they were the first ever to do any research on the Chehalis Reserve or Stahelis Reserve. I said, no, you weren't. <laughs> you know, but it's it's a show. It's a show and it's for entertainment. And their biggest priority is getting enough announced to justify another season. So they, And ever since the Blair Witch Project, that genre of sticking a camera in your face and running in the trees and looking scared, that's just what the general audience, especially the United States, wants to see, you know. Mm-hmm. If they had me talking about statistics and stuff in front of the camera and, and looking for tracks along a creek bed, well, you can't do that seven, uh, 12 episodes every year <laughs> and expect to maintain public interest. Right. But I will give them credit for finding Bigfoot, the, uh, at least the cast. They won't participate in any absolute hoaxing the first season some of the people in the background some of the people behind the camera were doing things to make the episode more exciting and they put their foot down and said we're not doing that ever again and i believe some people were actually fired so trying to make things happen that weren't happening you know what i mean and uh and the, to the cast's credit they put their foot down and said well, no we're we're not participating in anything like that no hoaxing but I got to admit, uh, some of their conclusions, I, I just scratched my head on because like one episode of somewhere in the east with two ladies driving by and they thought they saw this thing standing in the trees and Bob was standing in the spot trying to say it was probably a real Sasquatch and yet I could see the mark on the tree over his right shoulder that they were actually looking at. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's what you see. It only looked like it was moving because the car is moving, and they had an old VCR camera that the, the quality wasn't all that great. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I could see what the explanation was, but they couldn't. I don't understand why. Hmm. So, I mean, you've been asked probably every question under the sun, and I'll probably be bouncing all over the place with different things. I was kind of hoping you would talk a little bit about it in the beginning stages because I get a lot of people, you know, asking me why I don't buy in the whole structure and the tree snap thing and all that kind of stuff. Can you tell the history that you know in regards to, um, I think it was Dehenda, you could help me with that one, uh, th- about the tree snap and how... Oh, the it, twisted trees you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know how that began. That was all started by uh, the late Robert Titmus or Bob Titmus, he was known. He's a friend of mine and colleague as well. He's passed away. He's been passed away since 1997. Um... He suggested that in, the, in Northern California in the, in the mid 1960s, he was known these partially broken off trees and treetops and things like that twisted. And he he wondered if Sasquatch had something to do with that. It was a hypothesis, a question. But through time and retelling and people finding other trees here and there and everywhere. By the time the mid-80s rolled around, almost every documentary on television was saying Twisted Trees was a sign left by Sasquatch, as though that was an established fact. Mm. Well, that was never established. It was an hypothesis. It was a question, you know. 
I've seen hundreds of twisted trees and I've interviewed uh, hundreds of people who say they saw a Sasquatch, but I've yet to talk to anyone, uh, a reliable witness who claimed to have watched the Sasquatch twist a tree, you know? So it's one of these things that through time and retelling has taken on a life of its own. And in my opinion, it never should have. Mm. It never should have. It's still, a, it's still a possibility. I'm not denying Sasquatch does this. I'm just saying we got to have some evidence because originally it was just a hypothesis. It was a question. Can a Sasquatch do this? Because every time you find a twisted or broken tree, there could be other explanations for it. But too many people come into this today, and they say that Sasquatch, Sasquatch did that. What else could have done that? Well, you'd be surprised what wind, snow, frost, moose, bears do to young trees yeah. when, they, when, the, when there's something in that tree they want. Yeah. I mean, I saw a moose straddle in Alberta. I saw a moose straddling young trees to get at the shoots of the, of the top. Mm. The damn thing twisted and broke while it was straddling it. And of course, the moose wanders off, and there's that broken, twisted tree. Someone comes around now and, uh, now and sees that and says, Oh, well, look, Sasquatch sign. No. <laughs> and the same yeah. goes for shelters and nests. No one ever bothers to ask why these so called shelters are only 30 feet off a roadway or cut line. In other words, where people are. Yeah. You know? One one example, someone sent me said, "How can you explain this? We found no evidence, no evidence at all that of, of people being around. Just one old boot ten feet away that was obviously there a long time because it's half rotten." I said, "Well, you're one up in the south, but you got evidence of people. The boot, great. You know? Well, they said, "Well, no one's ever been here before." And I said, "Well, you're there. What makes you think no one else has ever been there?" <laughs> You know, and this is the kind of thing people assume, well, no one's ever been in this area before. How do you know that? Were you monitoring every trailhead at the time? How do you know no one's been there in the last two weeks? Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's totally a good point because, I mean, I, I remember what it was like back in the 60s and 70s. You know, the atmosphere of the, your, your hunting concepts and you're still kind of attached to being in the forest and the generation today. And this isn't, you know, a, a downer on the people who is the generation that's out there now. But I find a lot of people just don't really understand the bush or the rhythm of the bush anymore. They, we've definitely kind of disengaged from it. So, and then with the narratives that are online, because you've heard me say this too, and so is most people watching, uh, which is, you know, be cautious of the narrative you're hearing on the bloody screen here, because it primes your thinking. You don't know who I am. You've never met me before. And then we have the world's greatest researcher, which is the finger, of course, which mm -hmm. I should draw little eyes and a nose on, because it's in every video pointing at Sasquatch. It's the mm -hmm. world famous international finger researcher for Bigfoot, the Sasquatch. But, uh, you know, and I, and, and I find it amazing. And, uh, how uh, people get so positioned and defended when you're trying to find out, or I think we're supposed to be doing this, uh, what is it we're actually looking at compared to jumping the bandwagon ahead of things and saying, uh, this is a Sasquatch. And I think, I don't know how, uh, how you stayed involved with this for so long, because I mean, like, it's been over 40 years now, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. 1978, you know, I started. And I mean, when I connected up with you, I was just in it for, uh, I think, up to that point online, because that's when I started coming, becoming public online about the topic. I think three years, and by the fifth year, I just thought, I don't want to even come online anymore because the event is online. You know, like, I'm surprised you're not a raging alcoholic because <laughs> you've been doing this for 40 years and you don't even drink, which is well, nice. you got, you got a, Well, I made a vow uh, New Year's Eve 1989 after I broke my hand punching a pickup truck, apparently. Oh, nice. Yeah. I don't even remember it. But I vowed I'd never touch alcohol again. And you know, I never broke it. Mm. Never broke it. And, uh, um, the biggest problem with Sasquatch research today is the researchers themselves. Um, so many people that you see online on this, um, they call themselves researchers, but they're not. They're advocates. They're like religious leaders trying to push a faith rather than a researcher trying to find an answer. Nice. Right? Yeah. To be a researcher, you have to be willing to admit that in the end, it can turn out that you are wrong. It is quite possible, even though I don't believe it yet, 
quite possible that in the end, it may turn out the Sasquatch is nothing more than a great piece of Canadian or uh, Western North American mythology and folklore. I don't believe that, but I accept the possibility. So many people that you see are, who call themselves researchers today, they're like religious leaders. They're, they're totally convinced. They feel it's their responsibility to convince everybody else. And I gave up even caring if the general public believed in the existence of the Sasquatch a long time ago. I keep doing this, Leon, for one reason, one reason only. I want to know. <laughs> yeah. I want to know. Yeah. One way or the other. And, um, and if it's not, I don't feel I've wasted my time because I've done my part to catalog and, and record a great piece of uh, Western Canadian or North American with the Americans and their Bigfoot, um, North American folklore mythology. That's assuming the Sasquatch does not exist. Now, if it does exist, well, then it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it has to be a creature of flesh and blood, an unclassified um, primate, and uh, its discovery will be the discovery of the 20th and 21st century. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, yeah, it'd be wonderful. And so and do you buy just to realize how could we have missed this right um, do, you, do you buy there's this cover-up thing no this... no i i don't think the government's trying to keep anything a secret or anything like that i think the government's just doing what governments always do until they have solid evidence they don't really care right so so long you, it's in the realm of mythology and folklore and officially that's where it is they don't care um, now, if it is proven to exist, like if a bus kills one on the Trans-Canada Highway tomorrow and stuff, and the body's there, the first thing the politicians are going to do is talk to the scientists, and the scientists are going to examine it and say, yes, this is, it is flesh and blood, and it does exist, then the government will care. <laughs> but until that happens, we're still at stage one. Yeah. Does the Sasquatch exist or not? Yeah. And I think that's what's been frustrating for me, too, is because um, <laughs> I remember when we first met, I was going up to, uh, what was that lake up in Mission where the Sasquatch Mission sighting was? Uh, Hoover and it was, lake? Yeah, Hoover Lake. And I was all excited, you know, and then I, of course, I stopped in and saw you and you just blew the sail, wind right out of my sails by telling me, oh, yeah, I know the guy that was on there. <laughs> yeah, his name was Brandon Pollock. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you have all these, you have all these guys online, not all these guys, but certain people online, like Thinker Thunker and that. And you can see that this Sasquatch, or this is always a Sasquatch because I can look how it walks down inside of that area and who can walk like that. And Benton, this two narrative that's attached to it that I bought into for sure, because I want to find a Sasquatch. So I get a little excited. And yeah, you just blew that one right out of the water. <laughs> but I need to know that. Now, like you said, I need to know when I'm wrong because I want to find out what's factual. And, and it's been, it, I mean, that other story you shared with me, that's, again, I mentioned a little bit on that video there about we were talking about coyotes making really bizarre sounds and how, uh, what, what flats were they called again? You the Chehalis Flats. Yeah, and the Chehalis Flats there and how I heard the same sound and then, and how the people who are accusing you, you know, once well, you get it on tape and get it on video, well, the people who actually recorded it, they never got it on video and they're asking you yeah. to. And then you ask me if I did, which made me laugh my head off there. Because <laughs> uh, you want to share a little bit about that story, if you don't mind? Well, the, the whole reason it all that happened, there was this couple that lived in the trailer park. There's actually a neighborhood of houses there next to the flats now that were not, they hadn't started construction on those yet at the time. So, the, so only the trailer park was there. And uh, an elderly couple who lived in the trailer park contacted uh, John Green and uh, said, we, we've got this thing howling out in the flats. And this isn't the first time this kind of thing is reported. I've looked at footprints, alleged footprints on the flats too. And there's a long history of sightings and other things along the flats because it's right outside the, the Stahelis Reserve, which is where the term Sasquatch was coined in the first place back in 1929. So a long history, this is the area where it all began. <laughs> And John Green, the late John Green, suggested to them, well, the next time it happens, put your camcorder out on the, on the patio and, and record them. And she said, well, why? It's pitch dark. You can't see anything. Yeah, but at least we'll hear what you're talking about. And it did happen again. And they did play it. And there was a recording. And we got all excited. 
myself, John Green, Jerry Matthews, uh, or another fellow whose name has gone out of my head. But uh, we, th we all got excited because they were exactly like famous alleged recordings from the past. The Powallop recordings of 1969, the Shahomas recordings in 1979, the Klamath River recordings in 1993, recordings that I would have bet money on would eventually be proven to be Sasquatch in origin. Mm. Um, and just down the road from there, a year before, these same sort of sounds were heard, and I heard it myself uh, by another lady in another trailer park, and that's another reason I was so excited, because they were exactly the same. I thought, well, we got one. Obviously, we probably got a Sasquatch that's moved back in the area. Well, one, mor one morning, uh, 2004, Jerry Matthews and myself were out in the flats looking once again. We heard the sounds. We went rushing in their direction. Unbelievable. We're going to see it now. This is it. We've got it. And we did. We saw it. It was a coyote. Mm -hmm. It looked like invisible hands were squeezing this animal's guts and was letting out these incredible cries. And I thought I knew every sound a coyote made. Hell, they've been where I've lived among them my whole life. Back in Waterville, Alberta, we, me and my ex-wife used to sit out the porch night and listen to them. There was like a serenade going off all over the place. Coyotes everywhere. They're all over the place here. I got them in my yard. I'd never heard a coyote make this type of sound before. And what happened, a second coyote came bounding out of the bush, and they both reverted back to that familiar yip, yip, yipping sound we've heard a million times and are familiar with. And they went off like happy puppies, jumping all over each other. It looked like a happy reunion. Mm. They went running off down the flats towards Morris Valley Road before we lost sight of them. And I thought, well, damn. <laughs> At the time, well, I'm glad we discovered what made the sound. I'm just not happy with the conclusion. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. I said, you know, this, not only did uh, I think we explained away the Shahela sounds, but I think we've also found, explained away the Paul Allup recordings in 1969, the, the Shahomish recordings in 1979, and the Kalaman recordings in 1993 that people have been taken out on expeditions all over the States and call blasting with. And what I think it is, is just a rarely heard location cry that coyotes use that you don't often see because yeah. when they see each other and they're in view of each other, they have that familiar yip, yip, yipping type call all the time. But this was something like another coyote was nowhere in sight and was trying to contact it. The second coyote never answered. It just came running towards it. And I think it's a rarely heard location cry by coyotes. So half the time, I think people are using these on their so-called call blasting expedition. They, uh, they're just getting coyotes calling back and, and they don't even know it. And, uh, and when I released this, like when I announced our findings on this case, the Shahela sounds, 2004, 2006, boy, were there a lot of people and fellow researchers who use these sounds and actually that just didn't want to hear it. Guys I knew, I, I knew and respected, like John Freitas and stuff like that, they did not want to hear it. I had even people suggesting it was a Sasquatch imitating a guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, and I thought, my God, you're willing to accept the Sasquatch TV. You want to accept the coyote? Did that, that's a little strange to me, but yeah, you know. Well, well especially with three of us now seeing a uh, Sasquatch seeing a, a coyote doing that. Yeah. It's like, well, we've seen it now. And that, I mean, I seen it mine, what, almost 10 years, 15 years after you saw the same, yeah. or heard that had the same experience. So there's got to be, I don't know, again, this whole craziness that has gone through. I, and I do believe it's getting better, especially the younger generation, because mm -hmm. they're, they just don't put up with it. And, and we've been online so much listening, looking at structures and the sacred explorer of the finger pointing and narrating that this is it. Yeah. And no one ever says why specifically it is for sure a Sasquatch that is doing it. And why would a Sasquatch do it? Oh, and actually know that data needed to vet the information for us viewers at home that we get. Okay, well, that makes sense. But yeah, well, well, it, to him, it probably is a Sasquatch in his mind, <laughs> you know, um, but as Rennie once said, 
I don't care about Sasquatch in his goddamn mind. I want to see Sasquatch out there in the bush. You know, and he's absolutely right. Uh, and I can say this right now, and I'll say it to all your, your, your listeners and viewers. I mean, any photographic or video evidence where the image is open to interpretation as evidence, it's just been rendered useless. Right. Even if it was a Sasquatch. If you have to point out what people are saying and tell them what they're saying, they're seeing, then you're seeing nothing. Because <laughs> the evidence has just went out the window. Yeah. Have well, you ever... they weren't there with me. Well, that's, the, that's a problem, isn't it? It's got to be Patterson film, Gimlin film quality or better. And even that, I don't think, will convince the scientific, i.e. the political world, that uh, Sasquatch mm -hmm. even exists. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's just, again... It, it's just so tough. We're, we're not in the forest at all in the chunks of time we're needing to be in the forest. You know, like I appreciate Justin from Mountain Beast Mysteries. I mean, he's in there for a month or so, a month and a half, I think, in that new area he's researching and stuff. And he's in there by himself. And that, those are the kind of people that I appreciate because, you know, at my age and your age, we have to stick next to not go in, into the deep bush like, like we used to do in the mm -hmm. old days. But uh, uh, there were some things I wanted to ask you, too, about some of the frustrating garbage that you have heard online. Could you kind of break some of that down? Like, yeah, I'm sure you listened to this whole massacre thing that came out with. Oh, please. Don't yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even though 10 years ago, it was kind of vetted already that it was just yeah. garbage. But, well, this uh, guy, I keep forgetting his name, but he goes by on YouTube. Uh, it's the title, How to Hunt. Oh, uh, yeah. Steve LaBelle or something like that. Yeah, yeah. He brought it all up again and got him going and. M.K. Davis has been pushing this massacre nonsense. It, it's, it's garbage. There's nothing to it. We pointed that out back in 2009. The late Bill Miller and myself put together an article just blowing the, all that and the claim right out the water as far as concerned. But it keeps coming up. And for some reason, people, there are a lot of people who want to believe it. I mean, you have to face the fact. Uh, there's a lot of gullible people out there that almost believe anything. <laughs> you know, I could start a religion tomorrow for the worship of bowling balls. I bet you within a month I'd have 40 followers. You know, <laughs> the scariest thing is these people are allowed to vote. Yeah. Well, the weird thing too is you'd probably have more subscribers on your channel and viewers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if you are scientifically based and data collecting, people don't. You know, and I mean, uh, again, for me, I've never been online to have lots of viewers, and I'm really appreciating, you know, I, like I have a few more now, like 890, but I mean, I don't need 890, I, even though I appreciate uh, mm -hmm. that it, the, this new narrative's getting out there, and more people are appreciating and saying, you know, thank goodness we're getting more people like these channels that are, are saying what it actually is, so we stop wasting, my goodness, we have wasted a lot of energy and time and finances, money on not the right data <laughs> mm. and especially when it comes to structures and that and it's kind of like a weekend warrior but a weekend warrior sasquatch is looking for structures and hanging out community and there's really nothing wrong with that but if it turns out that the structures like the ones we have here in the okanagan where i had to do that gullible white guy looking for sasquatch video uh you know i had to i had to fess up on that whole thing <coughs> sorry thomas i'm recovering there from that covid lockdown i was on um because you see me coughing too much. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and no, for someone who was online the other day who says, oh, nice smokers cough, I thought, man, that's another funny thing, how people jump right on you as soon as you're online, right? They have no uh -huh. idea who you are, and they project onto you as if they know everything about you. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I know. And they don't attack the argument. They attack you, so they've already lost the argument. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that goes on all the time. I mean, they're, they're, again, people like Todd Standing and, Randy Briss and, and other people who, as far as I'm concerned, are just blowing it out both ends. They're just making stuff up as they go. They have their legion of followers, and they always will. And no amount of uh, and people say, "Well, prove that he's making it up." I said, "I got better things to do than follow Todd standing around. I'm trying to find evidence for the Sasquatch. You want to believe him? You go right ahead. Right? Yeah. You go on chasing your tail. I just personally don't care." I know, I know uh, what I, my, my opinion, and I'm going to state it. And if Todd Stanning were to come across a Sasquatch tomorrow, I'd praise him up and down because he does go out in the bush. Who knows? Maybe he'll get lucky. I mean, Roger Patterson, I believe he actually filmed the Sasquatch on October 20th, 1967. But Roger Patterson was not a trustworthy person in real life. He was 
what I know of, I never met him. The poor guy died of Hodgkin's disease in 1972, but um, uh, I've known Bob Gimlin for many decades and we're good friends. And, and he's sort of confirmed. I kind of picture in the Yakima area, Roger Patterson was kind of like uh, the character uh, on the old Green Acre show, Mr. Haney. You know, um, everybody liked them. Most people like them, but everyone sort of knew, for God's sakes, don't give them any money because you'll never get it back. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of guy he was, right? Right. It doesn't make, and he spent a lot of a lot of his time, even though he was dying, looking for evidence of the Sasquatch because he got bucked the year before he got the film. He published a book called "Do a Bombless Snowman in North America Re Really Exist?" So he was right in there with the original crowd, the old the old guard, and um, what he was up with uh, Bob Gimmon in the Mount St. Helens region. He got a phone call saying something's happened in Northern California, which was the Blue Creek Mountain tracks. He went down there with Bob, Bob's time, Bob's money, Bob's gas, Bob's food. <laughs> uh, when they got, they just got either if the Sasquatch exists, they, they got the luckiest day uh, you could ask for. And they got yeah. film footage to back it up, right? Yeah. If it doesn't exist, it's the greatest hoax ever pulled on the, uh, on the public. Yep. Well, and I always joke about the person who probably is going to find it is somebody who's not even interested in it. <laughs> they yeah. go into the bush for the first time in his entire life. Yeah. Tops his keys in on the ground, looks down, and there's a bone or something there. <laughs> digs around. It's like you, you spent two or three days, 30 miles back in the bush in the middle of nowhere, not finding anything. And then you find out there was a sighting just outside someone's backyard. <laughs> Uh, six blocks from your own house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, what was one of the most interesting uh, investigations you went on? Well, I think the most interesting case, and I still think it's my favorite, was the uh, Ball Beer Creek incident of 1986, August of 1986. Uh, it's better known as the Chilliwack River find because for years we couldn't find out what the actual name of that little feeder stream was. It's mm -hmm. actually Ball Beer Creek. For years I called it Cow Creek. Sometimes it was called Cattle Creek or Kettle Creek. No one seemed to really know, but then we found out it was Ball Beard Creek. A buddy of mine named Jason found that out like in 20 minutes that I couldn't find out in 30 years. <laughs> because he knows where to look on the internet to find information. <laughs> Me, I, I was looking at books and maps and charts. Here. Books? What are those? Yeah, that has old things up there. What's, what's a map again? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, in yeah, the world yeah. you got pins in. Yeah. But an American couple was from Salt Lake City named Harris were, were on a fishing vacation. They were down on the river fishing. And all he remembered was looking over his wife, and she's looking back at their campsite, pointing. And he looked up, and he saw this large, what he described as a large gorilla-like thing, sniffing fish they had hanging from a gill stringer on a hook that at night they hung their lantern on. They had a gill stringer of about four or five trout on that. Mm. It took it, and just snapped it right off the hook and went running across uh, through their campsite and it crossed the main road and disappeared along the banks of Ball Beer Creek. Well, the main road back then was still a dirt road. It's paved now. The, the, the recreation is now called Riverside Recreation Area. I don't believe in 1986 it was even named. But uh, I found out about it because this fellow... Um, came up to me in town because he saw the sign of my vehicle and he told me about something that just happened and I think he's the guy that came running towards him after turn. he saw it too mm. uh, and they, he said to them what the hell was that and <laughs> what to say and uh, he came into town and I ran and I, I think I met up with him I'm pretty sure he was the same guy there were two other guys in the campground too at the far end and when I went to talk and interview the witnesses there the, I kind of wondered, did these two other guys pull something? Because they were kind of snickering about the whole thing, as I recall. But I went down across the road along the banks of Ball Bear Creek. The witnesses didn't. As a matter of fact, if I had been 15 seconds later, I would have missed them. Hmm. Because I had pulled in, I pulled into the exit of the campground and ran into this red pickup truck with a camper on it with U U Utah license plates. And it was them. They were just leaving. And I said, do you know anything about this uh, creature that was seen? And, and she says, oh, you mean the Bigfoot? And he looked at her like, shut up. 
<laughs> but after I calmed them down and stuff like that and told them I was what I did, they pulled off their leaving for an hour, an hour and a half or so. They told me the whole story. And, and then they left because they wanted, they were planning on driving all across Southern British Columbia and going up to Banff, Alberta and places like that before heading back home to the United States. So I went and I looked across the road along the banks of Bald Bear Creek. And that's when I found the tracks. The witnesses never saw them or never knew they were there. Mm -hmm. and, and right down by the creek bank, when the soft spots, that's where there were discernible footprints. And you could see where it went off through the grass and stuff. It was just basically marks in the grass, right? But I counted them because there was one spot under a, a bunch of old growth trees where it looked like it was milling about. It was like, like they weren't in a straight line. They were just all over, haphazard, all over. Kind of reminded me, like, I thought of it at the time, like a man looking for his keys. Like he dropped his car keys. He's trying to find them on the ground. And I think, assuming it did happen, it was a Sasquatch, that the thing had stopped and was walked and was observing to see if it was being followed. And eventually the trail went back in almost in the same direction it had before it got to this area under these old goat trees. And they disappeared on, on at the uh, bottom of a, a large rock slide uh, at, at the base of Ford Mountain. And some of these boulders were like the size of Volkswagen rat, uh, beetles, right? They were huge rocks, some of them even bigger. Uh, and I never found anywhere. I stayed three days there and I never found any place where they had come out either on the side, the front, or the top. And I never found the fish stringer, too. That was would have been nice to find, but I never found it. And so where it went once it walked, entered the, the, uh, the rock-strewn side of Ford Mountain, I have no idea. But it's one of the most fascinating accounts I've ever looked into, and I still wonder about it. Did you take, I think you took casts, didn't you? Or did you? I took two casts, one of which I lost eventually because... This was the first time. It wasn't the first time I ever saw footprints because this was the first time I ever really tried to cast one. And, you know, even though it says in the box, first I was amazed how much plaster of Paris it took to fill one footprint because I was buying these little milk cartons of plaster of Paris at the time rather than the big bags, right? Yep. Oh, this should be enough. I'm like, no. <laughs> so I had enough to cast two prints. And when it says, oh, you got to wait 20 minutes before pulling out, no, wait at least an hour. I gave mine an hour and a half nowadays, right? At least, no matter what the conditions are, before trying to pull it out. Because the first one I tried to pull out after about 20, 25 minutes, and it basically broke apart on me. So I learned so, that the hard way. Yeah. How do you tell, uh, just for people at home, because you, you give me some good insights there, when you're looking at a track, how can you tell if the track's in, mo in motion compared to when it's standing? Well, certain things, like when it's moving out and stuff, like the Parish and Gimlin film location is an excellent example of this. Roger only cast two two tracks the day that he shot the film. And being Roger, he picked what he thought was the most clear and distinct ones, the ones down close to the water. Now, it was Titmus who came by nine days later and cast 10 of the tracks in succession. And he cast what is known as the Laverty track, because Lyle Laverty actually photographed it. Right. It's the one, what's the example of mid-tarsal break I've ever seen. I showed those to you when you were here. I could right. show them to you now, but I have to dig them up. No, that's okay. We can save it for another time. But yeah, because that, that's what I remember asking. So what was the difference between the, to the two? Like in well, again, the, 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 the where it was stationary, there was no mid-tarsal break. It was rather flat-footed. But as it stepped out and sped up, you could see whole kinds of variances in the tracks and toe movement as well. And especially that mid-tarsal break where the heel comes down, then the front foot comes down, pushes back a mound of dirt in the middle of the foot, before it takes off again, right? And of course it pushes a little bit back on the toes when it takes off again. When it's standing still, you don't see that. So when it's moving, I mean, we do that kind of a little bit too when we're walking. If you're standing still, you'll notice the difference in your footprints than when you're moving and when you're running, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. And uh, uh, the thing too, I didn't get a chance to ask you this before is how many reports have you investigated? Because your, your map on your wall there has it looks like hundreds and hundreds of coated pins on it there. Uh, well, I don't want to set you up because maybe it's not hundreds. And I'm just <laughs> well, it's a lot. Put it that way. Yeah. Put it way. I got my uh, file book here, uh, British Columbia. I'm on case 220. Mm -hmm. That's British Columbia. I'm Alberta. I think there's about between 80 and 100 and other areas, Washington, Oregon. I got a files full of stuff there too. 
geez, I don't know, but uh, a lot. <laughs> and did you find this year, Thomas? Because we were, I, I really noticed that the reports for our area, because of the smoke that was up here this year, really could knock down any reports hardly at all for us this year. Uh, actually, I got somebody, <laughs> somebody yesterday contacted me, which is great. But how about yourself? I, mean, I think last time I talked on the phone, you were just heading out because you had finally a report or something that had come in. Did, have you noticed that? I, I had two reports along the uh, Harrison River, one on the east side and one down Mount near, near almost where the resort is. But unfortunately, both these cases, the witness, when they found out what I was and what I did, didn't want to talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. I've had a number of reports of footprints this year that were found. I've looked into that I think there could be other explanations for. Uh, but there was one case that just came out on September 21st in Golden Ears Park. I call him Mr. O, but he's actually a doctor, and he didn't. He wants complete confidentiality in this. And I actually posted a little video I shot on on the scene there on my blog site. And uh, he was just driving into uh, uh, it was a, a Monday, so the park was basically empty, and there's only one road in, one road out, and he was he was heading to the Long Beach area to do some hiking. And he was 8.6 kilometers in, just approaching a sign that warns of a horse crossing because there's horse trails for people who ride. When he just happened to glance his rear view mirror and he saw this thing cross the road behind him. Hmm. And he said it crossed the road in, in like uh, two strides, a uh, stride and a half, which would be like two, three steps, right? And just disappeared. And he said it was massive. And he actually stopped, turned around, came back and tried to see it again, but he, he looked into the trees, but he couldn't see anything, and he never saw it again. And he wondered about it. He wondered about it. He wondered about it. He told his sister about it, apparently, and and she told him, "Don't tell anyone about it." Don't tell <laughs> he thought, but he thought he should. So he looked at some local things, and I I can't remember who referenced him to me. I think it was uh, Jerry Matthews who ran the West Coast uh, Sasquatch. He told him about me to contact me, and. Uh, I, I, he called me and he told me what happened. And he he still thinks he actually thinks in his mind that maybe he was hoaxed that someone pulled something. Mm. He just doesn't want to think that the Sasquatch is out there. He's he knows about the Sasquatch. He's been in British Columbia in the Maple Ridge area his whole life. He's heard stories his whole life, but he never believed in it. And he and part of him still doesn't want to believe in it. And he thinks, well, maybe someone pulled something. But he said it was huge. Mm. And he thought it was rather feminine. And I said, why? He said, because of the way it walked. And I said, what do you mean? Did you see any breasts or anything? He said, no. And he said, that's just what went in my head. I thought it was a great, big, ugly woman in a fur coat. <laughs> you know, that's the way he described it. I don't know why, but he said, but I, I think it could have been female or a woman in a costume. Well, how tall was she? About eight feet. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, who knows? There were no there were mar certain marks in the ground and scuff marks in the area off the side of the road, but nothing that could be described as declared footprints. See, British Columbia is a horrible place to try and find trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I don't understand. Like some of the places you took me to, and that I look at your advice's forest there. I mean, here it's mostly lodgepole pine, so at least you can negotiate through it. But yeah, you get closer to where you're you're at there and on the coast, and it's like oh yeah yeah, it's just yeah. tiger jungle. Yeah. Yeah. Tiger jungle, totally. Yeah, tiger jungle. And that's because most of the forest down here is actually second and third growth. You know, all the old growth has been down, at least down by the riverbanks, has been logged through yeah. the decades. And once they get big again, it, it becomes easier to get through. But when it's in that stage, you get the leaf trees coming up, and eventually the cedars and the and the firs get big, and they drown those smaller trees out and stuff like that. But that takes a lot of years for that to happen. Right. Yeah, but in Britain, but the moss, it's just so spongy, you know, and anything that walks on it, you almost watch if you look. You just go step, you walk through there in the early morning and watch as the afternoon heat comes in, the mist disappears and stuff. You actually see your mark on the ground right. recover and it's gone. Right. <laughs> used to be a joke in the old days. If you want to see a Sasquatch, go to British Columbia. If you want to see its tracks, go to Northern California. <laughs> Because Northern California had a great, well, bad habit of not doing anything to harden their forest service roads. So you always had that layer of dust about an inch thick on the roads was 
it was it played havoc with vehicle air intakes, but it was great for tracks. Mm -hmm. It's not that way anymore. California now does treat their forest service roads, but they didn't back in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of uh, tracks found in the time, especially in the Bluff Creek region. But here in British Columbia, they're not dirt roads at all. They're rock-strewn forest, rain-soaked, rain-washed rock roads. <laughs> that unless something steps in that muddy spot right there, uh, it's not going to leave a track at all. Yeah, we're yeah. a little bit. We have a definite advantage in the Okanagan because a lot of it's there's a lot of sand and silt. Yeah, and and there's e it's easier to see tracks here yeah. definitely than there. Um, uh, Thomas, I don't want to I, I don't want to keep us too much. I mean, you, I know you and I can just talk or talk talk talk, but we can do that another time online. But I did want to ask a couple of questions. One question is, what's the number one rule? Uh, the for researcher, you mean? Yeah. Thou shalt not hoax. Not ever. For any reason, not even as a joke, thou shalt not hoax. Because you do, you get caught, your credibility is gone forever. Right. Never, ever hoax, never participate in a hoax. As a matter of fact, part of your job is exposing hoaxes. Right. And well, if you want to get involved in research, um, I don't know if this is part of your question, but yep. uh, drop the philosophy I've always lived by. Stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. And what should a researcher always have with him when he's out in the bush? Not just a researcher, anybody. Camera. Never, ever go anywhere. I don't care if you're just going uh, uh, through a section of town to get to the KFC store. Take your camera with you, okay? If you have to get up and uh, if you're camping at a campground and you have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to the outhouse, take your camera with you. You know, I don't care if it's a cell phone or a little Instamatic or a little uh, one of those old 35 millimeter wind up ones you used to be able to buy in the store or the most expensive camera you can buy. But take a camera with you because if you see something and you don't get a picture of it, you're just another person who says he saw a Sasquatch. And we don't know if you're telling the truth. Yeah. And the uh, next question I have for you is you think we'll get them on film with the technology we get, we're getting today? I hope so. I love it if it was. I personally can't understand it while we haven't. I mean, one of the biggest, biggest um, criticism I have was, like I said, I spent a lot of years in Alberta, uh, Western Alberta. So I had a lot of uh, contacts in Map National Park and Jasper National Park. And I was there when they didn't have the, the wildlife fences on the side of the road. Yeah. And they had a horrible time with that, trying to get people to slow down because it was terrible. They had what, for a year, they ran what was called the red flag program, and it was awful. You go through the park, and there's hundreds of these red flags. Everything from a squirrel to an elk to a grizzly bear had been killed by moving vehicles because people wouldn't slow down. So they finally gave up on that, and they decided to build wildlife fences like what we would got in the Coquihalla. Yep. And they built wildlife tunnels. And after the wildlife tunnels, they built overpasses overpasses covered in trees and stuff well this has been going on since the late 1980s and they have put cameras on those overpasses in those tunnels and you can see a lot of this on youtube it bothers the hell out of me that in the, in the years since the mid late 1980s till now they have got footage of every large animal you can think of that exists in the rocky mountain foothills Grizzly bears, elk, deer, moose, black black bear, cougars, lynx, bobcat, everything, raccoons. But they haven't got a photograph, they haven't got footage of a Sasquatch. I mean, Sasquatch has to cross the highway too to get from one end of the park to the other. It bothers me that something like this doesn't pick up. The only out they have is the cameras are not 24 hour, 365 day a year. You know, they're put out for a week here and a week there. But I keep pointing out, they have got footage of everything. Yep. Even some pretty strange people. <coughs> yep. they got, they've got footage of everything. But they've got nothing on the Sasquatch. And that bothers me because why? I mean, that, that bothers me. Why? I had a suggestion years ago 
if I had unlimited funding, what would I do? And I, I had what it was called the Coca-Cola project, yep. which was a, a, a solar powered um, trip camera at all the wildlife underpasses and all the river and creek uh, uh, under, uh, underpasses, anything big enough for a man to get through. And we run those cameras 24-7, 365 days a year. And for however long it takes to get footage of every large animal, uh, you know, uh, raccoon size or bigger, that we know is there. We don't get photo, footage of a Sasquatch, then that would convince me that there's no Sasquatch yet. Yep. Because people who say, oh, the Sasquatch went through when, when the cameras weren't there. I mean, it, in Banff National Park, where they have been uh, videotaping, that is a, still a, a relevant excuse, but it's getting to be a slim one. Yeah. No, and I was, we were talking to that because I remember you mentioned this to me three years ago and I was talking to some people about uh, in with Alberta Sasquatch getting together with those guys and saying, you guys do your side of the mountain and I'll do our side of the mountain in those mm -hmm. locations that you're sharing. <clears throat> because yeah, it's totally fun. The, the drawback is unfortunately <clears throat> the, uh, like you said, it's, uh, even to get out there in the winter time in some of these areas, because if, if you, you need them running 24 seven, seven days yeah. a week for 365 days of the year. And it's like the highway cams, you know, at least you can, you can check in the highway cams anytime you want, but the, those ones even go down uh, in regards to that. But that's basically the setup you're looking for, for sure. Um, yeah. oh, what else was I going to ask? I think, I think I'll hold off on some of that stuff right now for you guys. Uh, viewing at home there. I'll have a whole bunch of links underneath here, including I'll include uh, Thomas's books on here as well. Um, oh, I, I need to ask this one question because somebody asked me and I wanted to find out who the source was. And I thought it was from one of your books. I had heard that the Alberta Sasquatch is an, uh, about a foot bigger, seems to be larger than a BC one. Have you heard that? No, I think what they're basing that on is um, I definitely feel the Sasquatch in Alberta has got to be a hardier animal to get through the winters there. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's brutal. I mean, uh, the roads quite often, like the 940 trunk road, is usually still blocked by snow in mid-June. I mean, uh, <laughs> it can and be minus, minus 50, yeah. minus yeah. 50. But last time I lived in Alberta, 22 yeah. days, minus 50 with the wind chill. How does anything live in that weather? Yeah, and, and someone also said in the West Coast, the females seem to be bigger than males. I don't know where that came from. That is oh. from the, uh, it's the tribe. And you said that. I did say that because yeah, I yeah. actually, actually, if you go on my Facebook page, you'll see a documentary from the, uh, oh, I'm going to screw up the name again. <laughs> Nagis, uh, up in Port, up in Port, um, uh, anyways, it's on that doc. If you go on my Facebook page, there's a documentary up there for the First Nations. They're the ones who said that. Mm -hmm. He suggested that it's a lot, um, the, the female's uh, larger than the male was. Uh, uh, in, most, in the West Coast here, if you go by First Nation, all the history and tradition, the female's definitely a lot more dangerous yeah. than the males. Matter of fact, the name Sonaqua means cannibal woman. Yes. Loosely translated. And uh, the bookwas was a male. The bookwas was more benign, whereas the Sonaqua will get you if you don't watch out. That's in other right. words, wacky women. <laughs> Uh, but that's for the size in Alberta. There was a rash of reports in around the Bighorn Dam and the Abraham Lake area between 1948 and 1984. And of course, the lake wasn't there because the Kootenai Plains hadn't been flooded yet because the Bighorn Dam was built in 69. Great. Right. Of uh, people reporting extreme height reports. You had normal height reports at the same time six, seven, eight feet tall. But for some reason, between 1948 and 1984, there was a whole rash of people reporting 12, 13, 14. And of course, the big or dam is 15 foot tall individuals. At least that's what the people were in. Ronald Gamel driving along Abraham Lake, Lake watched three of them cross the road. He said every damn one of them was, uh, was over 12 feet tall. Wow. But what I found interesting was all these extreme height reports we're all in the same general area, like an 80-mile 80, 80 circle around Abraham Lake and the Bighorn Dam. The first one I got is from 1948, and the last one I got was 1984. After 1984, suddenly the extreme height reports in Alberta stopped, at least as far as I know. Remember, I left Alberta in 2002. Right. But normal height reports, six, seven, eight feet tall, continued. 
Now, what was this just a batch of creatures that were extremely big that lived out their lives and passed on? Who knows? I just find that there, people were overestimating the heights. Why were all the estimations in the same general vicinity? Right? That, that was interesting to me. Yeah, and we've had, we've had a few here. I got a report a couple of years ago in 2012, just, just east of town here, a fellow coming back from what he called an end of the world party. I remember end of the world party, you know, um, 2012, the Mayan calendar thing. Yeah. And he was coming back around midnight and he said he saw this thing stand up. that was sitting on the side of the road and actually walk into a person's yard. And this person had a big overhang you know, beam overhang in the entrance. And that overhang is 12 feet tall. And he said it had to duck to get under it. Mm. So who knows? I think the average height for a Sasquatch is probably six, seven, eight feet tall. But like humans, every now and then you get one that's really big. Right. Yeah. Or it could be overestimation in the excitement of the moment. But it's very interesting in Alberta that all these overestimations occurred in the same general area. Mm. Yeah, could, yeah, it could be a genetic, thing, could be a genetic thing too for them. Could be. Yeah. Who, who's the thing on? Who's the buddy on your right hand shoulder there? Oh, this is a Gigantopithecus black eye, which was a huge Asian ape that probably went extinct about oh, uh, oh a million years ago. Maybe, or actually, uh, some say a million years ago. Some say as recently as ten thousand years ago. Mm. But the theory is that this old boy. Probably when he was alive, probably migrated across the Bering Land Bridge at the same time the ancestors of our First Nation people did. And Sasquatch is simply this species continuing, right? I don't know if I agree with that 100%, but to me, that's the one that makes the most sense. And it was the late Grover Krantz that came up with the hypothesis that Gigantopithecus was an erect biped. And he based that on the fact that the lower mandible, which right here. <laughs> Look at that jaw. Yeah. Holy smokes. Seems to be very wide. Yeah. Whereas most chimps and gorillas have a very narrow jaw, lower jaw, because they're quadruped. The head is forward of the body. Right. But this is more similar to ours because, and the only reason for that is that he thought, felt that the neck is in the way, which suggests, at least suggests, that perhaps Gigantopithecus black eye was an erect biped, hmm. at least at times, right? Now, other people say, no, Gigantopithecus was, was not an erect biped. It was quadruped. Maybe it was. Maybe it was both. It's like the reports of the Yeti in the Himalayas. There are reports of it being bipedal, and there's a lot of reports of it being quadrupedal. The Sasquatch is always bipedal most of the time, unless some people saw it climbing up a steep hill or something that's using its hands to assist. But that was the, that's the hypothesis. It's an hypothesis to me that probably makes the most sense to explain what the Sasquatch is in the fossil record. But hey, it's just an hypothesis. It could be totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Thomas, what do you have coming up on the, on the future there? Are you on any uh, podcasts or on any other shows that are coming up? I'm supposed to uh, do something tomorrow night on a blog cock program with, um, uh, oh, oh, let me see getting names <laughs> well i'm going to be doing a, a, a documentary with omni films right and then we're going to be out next week and doing that another documentary film I'm supposed to go up along the anderson river again just searching uh yeah, tomorrow expert. yeah um i'm supposed to do a podcast uh but this is going to be audio only uh i can't, can't remember the name of the show just off <laughs> Uh, I wrote it down. Uh, talking all Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. It was a podcast program. <clears throat> Larry Baxton's show. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he will be talking about Sasquatch there. Larry's the kind of a guy who likes to grill people and expose them. And he's, he's going to try and step me up, I suppose. I know, Larry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's going to try and step me up. So I'll be doing that tomorrow night. Nice. Another show. And of course, I'm going out all the time and uh, just looking and trying to find something. Yep. And well, I just I, carry on. I'm 59 years old. I'm not going to quit now. I'm just. I know. <laughs> You're two years older than I am. Yeah. 
<laughs> we'll have to get matching Sasquatch walkers when we're in the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just be happy if someone would come back from the pearly gates. I mean, give me a ghost call on the, uh, on the phone. I mean, yeah. you guys know the truth now. Just yeah, let yeah, me know yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. Like I said, my buddy and colleague, Bill Miller, just passed away October 1st. Mm -hmm. And, of course, John Green's gone now and Rennie's gone now. And I like to think these guys now know the truth. And they're probably laughing at me saying, figure it out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I just want to know. Like I said, I I do this now because I want to know. Yeah, I want to know. Does the Sasquatch does indeed exist, or doesn't it? And if you know, then I'd probably be happy with that. Yeah. Well, I I think the younger generation with technology, we have a, a lot higher chance now than what we had. So I totally appreciate talking with you, Thomas. Oh, my and pleasure, yeah. my pleasure. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, like Sasquatch I Okanagan. <laughs> <laughs> when I pick, Sasquatch Okanagan. When I picked Bigfoot Okanagan, Facebook wouldn't allow me to use the name of Bigfoot Okanagan because they thought it was a foot fetish site. <laughs> God knows what they think of the word Sasquatch. How they miss yeah. it. <laughs> well, I tried Sasquatch, but it kept it kept rejecting it. I don't know why, and that's why yeah. I had to go to Bigfoot Okanagan, but uh, I hope to see you uh, again soon online and also uh, get you online on some other sites that have been asking me, can you get Thomas on? I said, well, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. And I know you're always open to it. And I think, and again, like I mentioned, I've so much appreciated your, the way that you think. I mean, the other interesting thing is, you know, everybody by name. And, it, and not only do you know everybody by name, the other thing that impressed me when I was seeing you was you follow these people, some of them for their entire lives. You know, when they die, they, you, you, you became friends with their families, some of these witnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's a great researcher. You're not just there for that. You're actually there for the long term with them. And, um, but that's all I wanted to uh, share with you tonight. And... Uh, I really appreciate you, Thomas, and I think it's important that your voice is out online again. Well, thank you. Uh, hopefully, next time I won't spend 30 minutes trying to figure out I have to put a button on here to get my mic to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's all part of this learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. Well, I'm going to just uh, shut off here, but we'll stay online and chat for just a bit more if that's all right with you. Roger that. Awesome. Thanks, Thomas. No problem. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>